And with us, we have advocate Michal kotler wonch She was senior policy and strategy advisor, former member of Knesset 2020-2021 for the Blue and White Party, served on a number of committees, including chair on the subcommittee on Israel Diaspora Relations, we're going to have a lot to discuss, and as member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee and Constitution, Law and Justice Committee. And we also have, to my right, uh, Dr. Manuel Navon, an expert in foreign policy at Tel Aviv University and the Reichman University, formerly the IDC, uh, senior fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategy and Security, as well as the Kohelet Policy Forum. And you're also the author of the book, The Star and the Scepter, A Diplomatic History of Israel. So thank you for joining us. My pleasure. So where do we begin? Uh, we don't necessarily know the final results of the election. But we can definitely ask, how are you this morning? Yes. You know, I start, always start my morning with exercise, so after my <laughs> exercise, I'm fine, I'm fine now. And how are you, what's your feeling um, the morning after the election, seeing the direction that Israel, the Israeli political system is headed? Look, on the one hand, finally, we do have a clear-cut result after four consecutive elections that led basically to a stalemate. So on the one hand, this is a welcome result because we're finally going to have a government, so hopefully. On the other hand, I am, I must say, concerned by, by the result because uh, the ally, it's the first time in the history of the country, basically, that Likud is going to form such a radical government uh, with extremist parties and not a center-right uh, government. And I'm concerned because the allies in Netanyahu, such as Betzal Smotrich and uh, Itamar ben -Gvir, are radicals that he's going to have in his co coalition also the orthodox parties who also already won the finance ministry, for example, who are going to refuse to make any reforms in the edu educational system about mandatory learning of math and English, for example. And, of course, the fact that Netanyahu, and this has been said by his uh, partners during the campaign, uh, is going to use this uh, majority to uh, promote uh, tailor-made leg legislation to try and stop his trial and completely change the balance of power, the separation of powers in Israel. One last word, you mentioned that I'm at the Kohelet Police Forum. I do believe that in the 1990s, the Supreme Court uh, created a, a lack of balance in the separation of powers by giving too much power to the court and to uh, legal advisors. But what this upcoming coalition is trying to do is not to create some kind of balance, but to replace an imbalance by another one, by subduing the courts and the judicial system to the executive, uh, and by basically canceling judicial review. That is very dangerous. So I'm concerned by this. Uh, on, as I said, on the one hand, I'm glad that we finally have a, a government, but I'm really not excited at all about the way it's going to, to look like. So I want to offer actually a, maybe a bit of a different perspective on that. And I say, just remind us um, where we're sitting um, in the miracle that is the nearly 75-year-old state of Israel to which an indigenous people returned after millennia of exile and persecution, committed to equality. That is the Declaration of Independence. I believe very deeply that, and you know, I, 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 I actually entered at what I, I believe is a point or intersection of real challenge, both in terms of, or all three, in terms of Israel's internal resiliency between Jews and Arabs, between ultra-Orthodox and secular, between Israel and global jury and that incredibly important relationship as a nation state, and in terms of Israel standing in the international arena, in terms of international law and so forth. I do think that we are in the midst of a democratic process, and it is a democratic process, and we have to respect it as a democratic process, and it is as imperfect as Emmanuel touched upon some of the points, 100%, but we are in the midst of a process, and I am very grateful that the way that it's playing down or playing out or showing down in this young democracy is through elections. Granted, five elections in three and a half years were not pleasant for any of us, and the instability that ensued on every level, in particular during COVID, a global pandemic, were very difficult, but I do think that we are still in the midst of a process, a very important one, and we have to keep the understanding that it is those foundational values upon which this country was, were founded, i.e. liberal values and Zionist values and the intersection between them that keep us going ahead into the what will I don't know yet what will the next government will look like. I very much hope that it'll look like something that's much more balanced than the continued attempt to balance the imbalance of power with um, um, diminishing the power of yet another power, in this case, the Knesset. 
Michael, but I, what, it's important to relate to what Emmanuel just said, and I wonder how you feel about this. The idea of having an extremist coalition or perceived extremist. You're a maven on Israel diaspora relations. You know the concern some of the Jewish communities have out there vis a vis such coalition. So, first of all, I want to be very clear that we don't know what the coalition will look right. like yet. In my. Um, but religious Zionists have come out very prominent. So, so I'll say very clearly in, in my best case scenario, we would be headed to a, a coalition based on ideas, on shared ideas, not on um, um, who uh, we are for or against, but rather what binds us together. In my perfect world, this is the perfect opportunity for a unity government that would give representation and actually a reflection of what I know is the majority moderates of this country. It is not likely what's going to happen because as you say, there is a huge constituency that came out as a reaction um, to vote for, um, well, they, they sort of snubbed the name, the is religious that, Zionism. Yes. I don't believe that they represent religious Zionists. I'm one myself. I think Emmanuel is one too. And I think that that is part and parcel for the challenge that we face, it is going to have to be something that um, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, as it looks like the next prime minister, actually takes very carefully into account, understanding those three dimensional challenges that we face, including Israel standing in the international arena and her critical relationship with the global jury. Emmanuel, you work a lot with uh, the European community, and we talked a little bit about North America already. Um, what do you see happening now as a result of this government? That well, we're again, also? if we are going, as is very likely, uh, towards a coalition between Likud, uh, so-called religious Zionism, I agree with Michal that they don't deserve this name, uh, at least I say so, and the two orthodox parties, uh, good luck on our foreign relations. And you say, we don't know, we're going to, you talked about our liberal values, Michal. Well, do you know what's the plan of Bezalel Smotrich? Because I read his article. He, read, he wrote a very detailed article about what is his plan for the future of our conflict with the Palestinians. Uh, it's a very long article. I read it very carefully. And he says very clearly he wants to establish an apartheid regime, annexing all the territory without granting citizenship to the Arabs. He said they will not get citizenship. They will not vote. But we will annex, annex the territory. Now, I do a lot of work like you do, Michal of what we call in Hebrew as bara, of trying to explain Israel, making Israel's case in the foreign arena, especially in Europe. Mm -hmm. These guys, and, and Smotrich and, 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 and uh, Ben Gvir, say openly that they want to establish an apartheid regime in Israel, uh, and they say it very openly. That's their plan. Now, will Netanyahu let it happen? The problem here is that Netanyahu himself is a very cautious person. He's very aware of Israel's foreign relations. He's done a very good job in foreign relations. But the problem is that he put himself in a trap because he's going to have to go with those people. Uh, I, I claim that his main concern today is to try and stop his trial with this telemed legislation, which he can only do with them. And, and he won't have a choice. And believe me that uh, uh, both Bezalel Smotrich and especially Itamar Ben-Gvir have already proven that they really don't care about Netanyahu, they care about themselves. They won't have no problem embarrassing Israel. And, and we have a very big problem here because on the one hand, Netanyahu is aware of the fact that such a coalition is going to be a huge problem for Israel's foreign relations. But on the other hand, his main concern, his only concern, I would say even today, is his trial, and he will go with them anyways. So we have a big problem. There is, though, another issue that Netanyahu has you know, been priding himself over the last uh, decade or so of being the, you know, the, the leader of this issue, and that's the, the Iran deal, or the not Iran deal at the moment. Could, uh, could um, that, if, that's, you know, if that becomes relevant again, be something that, um, that Netanyahu takes into consideration with regards to the rest of his policies within the government? What I'm asking is that if, if there's an opportunity for him to be, again, you know, the defender against the Iran deal, um, could he perhaps um, try to offer, you know, um, Benkville or otherwise other things to deal with to, to, to kind of lower the flames in order to give for him, um, you know, this position again of being Israel's savior uh, over Iran? The f Sorry. Sorry. No, the fact that he thinks that he's a savior is that way. That's what he's been saying. But the, the fact is that today in 2022, almost 23, uh, the, the, the Iran is already a threshold country. I mean, it's already a nuclear country. We have to understand, we're not in 2015 anymore when the JCPOA was signed, okay? Uh, when Netanyahu went to Congress in, in, in March 2015, uh, right before the Israeli election at the time, and spoke against the deal, he failed 
he failed to convince Congress uh, to, with a two-third majority to vote against the deal. And he failed to block the uh, agreement. The agreement was signed. He managed to convince uh, President Trump to pull out of the deal. But this actually brought Iran closer to the bomb because there were no restrictions any, anymore on its uh, nuclear program. So we already passed that stage, uh, uh, Talia. Uh, Iran is already a nuclear country. So, so I just wanted to add to that, we're certainly not in 2015 anymore, we're in 2022 and a couple of other things have shifted in the world around us and I actually think that it brings a tremendous responsibility to do a continuation of what actually maybe at the time would have been, um, a, a, you, know, sort of, you know, sort of pulling the mask off of the double standard hypocrisy. It's much easier today to hold countries to account and institutions mandated to uphold, promote and protect this international rules-based order which is collapsing all around us and I don't need to give examples here. So I don't just think that it's Iran, and I think that the understanding that utilizing international law and actually rising from the docket of the accused, which, as you know, um, and I would be remiss if I didn't mention it right here and right now, the case of two deceased soldiers, Hadar Golden, Aron Shaul, and two Israeli civilians, Avera Mengistu and Isham Sayed, actually representing the widest cross-section of our society, of what Israel is. Um, at the end of the day, the understanding that this is an opportunity to rise from the docket of the accused, to utilize and salvage what's left of that international rules-based order in the um, understanding that it's not just about Iran and it's certainly not just about its pursuit of nuclear or ballistic capabilities, but about the um, um, uh, imperative to hold it to account for the gross human rights violations that are ongoing, as we all know, and I do think that they intersect with a little bit of what Emmanuel touched upon, and that is, you know, there's been this uh, constant war that was waged on the state of Israel, I believe after a series of conventional wars were lost right around 1973, whether it was and post the three no's of Khartoum, and here I'll get to some good news where I believe we should touch upon even in this constellation, and, and that recognition was that conventional warfare cannot actually defeat the state of Israel, and therefore the weaponization of international law and the institutions and organizations created and mandated to uphold, promote, and protect that rules-based order, that was under mind the moment that the Zionism is ra racism resolution passed in 1975 followed with later much later in the 2001 Durban conference against racism which was an anti-semitic hate fest followed by 21 years of Israel apartheid weeks on campuses and when we use the term apartheid selectively and we're old enough to remember what apartheid looked like we do two things we not only actually minimize what those that suffered under the apartheid regimes a uh, regime um, 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 suffered so terribly but we actually undermine the possibility of advancing our locality with our very, very different set of challenges. I think that that's true with regards to many of the issues that we touch upon. And again, to come back to this government and even to the Abraham Accords, which offer a tremendous amount of, I think, hope and maybe even leverage for Benjamin Netanyahu, assuming that he um, um, puts together that next coalition with what I believe you're right will be, I mean, the proof will be in the pudding, will be his opportunity to appoint different people that speak, speak a different language, not only internally, but to global jury and to the international community. So I can think of Likud members that would serve in those roles to be very clear on what it is that the state of Israel will be leading in what hopefully will be, you know, for stable years. You know, Michal, I've been fighting a lot, and I still fight a lot of people who use the word apartheid, yeah. all those uh, a radical organization. I just published an article against five foreign uh, uh, European um, foreign ministers who used the word apartheid to dismantle the claim to fight it. But what Smotrich and uh, Ben Gvir want to do is apartheid. It is. That I'm, just I'm read, not going to talk about the theoretical. Right? No, but so, that, I mean, what, they no, but it's not been, theoretical. They right. are now in going to be in the government. Right. So, 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 you know, that's, right. that's what we're going to have to deal with. You mentioned the Abraham Accords. When Netanyahu, the, the only reason why those accords were made possible is because Netanyahu committed, he committed to the Trump administration, to the UAE, and to Morocco not to proceed with the annexation plan. Now, he has people in his government who are annexationists, but who don't want to give citizenship. So good luck also on the Abraham Accords. I'm in favor. I'm, I'm a big fan of the Abraham Accords. I do everything to, to try and, and expand them. But now you're going to have people in the Netanyahu government who are going to say, we'd rather have annexation without citizenship for the Arabs rather than the Abraham Accords. So it's going to be a big headache for Netanyahu, as I said, because he's, as I said, he has this tension on the one hand, he wants 
to have this, co this coalition for his uh, trial, but on the other hand, he knows exactly the price that the state of Israel is going to have to pay internationally. But maybe, maybe there is somewhat of a solution. And I want to relate to your history with the Blue and White Party and your familiarity with Benny Gantz. Netanyahu has always been accustomed, we've been accustomed to Netanyahu creating a coalition of somewhat moderation, making sure that he has by his side either Ehud Barak or Tsipi Livni or the appeal to uh, uh, now President Herzog at the time leader of labor. Is there a chance that we may see, in your opinion, Benny Gantz and his party as part of this coalition, maybe to counteract some of uh, potential influences that may come from the direction of the religious Zionists. And would you advise this to him, given the history that he was promised to be a rotational prime minister and that right. kind of went down the drain? So, so I'll say something. First of all, my, my own sort of decisions, and it affected my own decisions in the past, because I do believe that uh, when you speak in the name of unity and um, healing rifts and reconciliation, um, then you have to be consistent about that those mottos, that mantra, they have they have meaning, and you have to create the vision that leads forward. I would very much, including you know a, a public call this morning, would very much hope that all of the bans um, and just not BB mantras will actually fall by the wayside, with a very clear understanding that actually those that call for unity and reconciliation and healing of the rifts um, has to begin with a reflection of what the majority of the Israeli public actually moderate public and it's actually one of the to me one of the greatest sad points is that the majority of the Israeli public over and over again now fifth election at a time is somewhere in that majority moderate I don't want to use the word center because it doesn't mean anything anymore but are moderates and not extremists extremists and squeezing out those moderates or preventing them from representational leadership in Knesset that actually leads consistent long-term policy and plans that is is equally and consistently applied to all is what empowers the extremists and I stand by that very strongly so the short answer is I would very much hope that there would still be the place for and I don't know if it'll be Benny Gantz and in what constellation or I don't know if it'll be anybody else from the existing sort of um, you'll call it you know the just not BB block that in terms of ideas there is no daylight between many of those um, parties and individuals serving in them um, the likelihood of it happening is quite small because there have been all kinds of, you know, sort of promises made that because of the, somebody said yesterday, because of the short time between elections, politicians can't anymore afford to lie in the public, you know, forgetting. That's not the way that I hope that no, will undo the damage, but yeah. Emmanuel, I'm see, I see yes. you here shaking your head quite a bit, so let's uh, hear what you have to say on the issue. <coughs> there is a 65 majority for Netanyahu. The chances of him today to behave the way he did in the past, you said it rightly, in the past, he would al always form coalition with, with moderates, right. always. It's not the same Netanyahu today. Netanyahu was indicted in 2020. Mm -hmm. He cares only about trying to stop his trial, okay? It's not the same Netanyahu, and therefore it's just not going to happen. Why, after five elections, well, as far as he's concerned, he's finally getting his dream coalition with extremists. Should he go for a unity government? Why should he do this? Just listen to what he did to Gantz, the, the head of your former party, two days before the election, uh, uh, doctoring a video to say he sac so supposedly he sacrificed Israeli soldiers to save Palestinians. It was a doctored video. You really think he's going to call him in a coalition now? Seriously? Dream on, it's not going to happen. It's not the same Netanyahu. He already has a coalition. So what's changed? Only the trial? Well, I think first of all the trial, that he has his, uh, he, he does definitely want today. I mean, when you listen to his uh, allies and uh, spokespeople on, in the media, they all claim that the trial is, it was all made up. They have all types of uh, conspiracy theories about some kind of deep state that wanted to uh, unseat him from uh, the prime ministership. That is the narrative. He just look at the uh, legal program of so-called reform of his new ally, Bezalel Smotrich, which is very clearly to subdue the judicial system to the executive, to end judicial review, to you from Canada, to have the override clause with a simple majority of 61. So anytime the court strikes down a law, you just pass it again with a simple majority. And then you appoint judges for eight years and you fire them if you don't like their rulings. That is not an independent judiciary. That is his plan. That is what he's going to do now. With the trial, he has this, this obsession 
of trying to legislate, to with tailor-made legislation, to try and, and stop his trial. That is very clear. Uh, they're talking about what they, they call by mistake in Israel the French law to make, uh, which is, is wrong because this law already exists in Israel, it's for the head of state, not the prime minister, but whatever, so that uh, you cannot put the prime minister on trial. Uh, ben Gvir said we're going to pass this law retroactively. Retroactively, he said it. So, so he has now the coalition he wanted to stop his trial. Why should he trade it for a coalition with guns uh, uh, for something else. He, he's not going to do it. It's not the same Netanyahu. Netanyahu 2022 is not the Netanyahu of the past. He used to be restrained and, and, and cautious. Today he is he's unbound and, in my opinion, dangerous because of that. So it's just not going to happen. He, and even if theoretically he would say now to Ben Gvir and Smotrich, you know what, instead of you, I'm going to take Benny Gantz. First of all, there was already an experiment. I don't have to tell you because you were in this coalition. Uh, he, uh, there was a coalition with Benny Gantz, and, and, and then he broke the, uh, the agreement by blocking the passing of a budget. So Benny Gantz already uh, has, been, uh, you know, uh, has been betrayed by Netanyahu. Why would he do it again? Uh, and so I, I don't believe it's going to happen because that's not what Netanyahu wants to do right now, uh, this uh, kind of moderate coalition. And then it would be a coalition of, let's say, 63, because Gantz has, according to the latest, the latest counting, 12 MKs. Uh, uh, and uh, the so-called uh, religious giants has 14. So that would be going down from 65 to 63. Right. And we remember exactly how this coalition worked in the fact. That's not what his agenda is about today, unfortunately. I hear great disappointment, but I want to ask you, Emmanuel, are you disappointed with Netanyahu and the coalition, or all of the facts that you're mentioning now have been explicit in the face of the Israeli public? The Israeli public is very much aware of the trial. They're very much aware, like you indicated, about Smotrich plan and Ben Gvir. Shouldn't we respect the did choice made by the people. No, but you're disappointed. Did I, did I, I, I think that in a democracy you're allowed to disagree, to oh. accept the decision of the majority, and to be allowed to say, I don't agree with it, but I accept it. I think this is still part of our democracy, even though I'm very concerned about what our democracy is going to look like if and when Netanyahu passes this type of legislation, know, which, would, which would end judicial independence. By the way, the reason why Netanyahu is currently at 65 is because two parties in the anti-Netanyahu camp did not pass the threshold. Otherwise, he would be at 60, 61. Don't forget that. So it's not that a huge majority of Israelis. It's about 50% plus of Israelis, which is a majority. It's fine. But it's not like 80% of 90%. Let's put things into proportion. So saying that you don't, uh, you're not happy with the outcome doesn't mean that you don't accept it and don't recognize it. That's part of democracy. Manuel, what could have been done differently over the past year when it comes to maybe be at the, the center right or the moderate. You yourself put your support for Gidon Sal to, to lead this country and we see where he is now. I don't remember hearing from him recently. What could have been done differently? Look, many things could have been done differently. I just believe that it was the right thing to do given the circumstances uh, of a year ago to prevent a fifth election. I do think that the outgoing, I have many criticism and problem with the outgoing coalition, but they did some, a lot of good work, especially in the econo with the economy. And uh, I think that it was the correct thing to try and, and prevent a fifth election to, to pass a budget. Maybe there was not enough content to say not only do we want to replace Netanyahu, but what do we offer? That's also part of, I agree, it's part of the problem. But some good stuff was done in terms of judicial reform, in terms of economic reform. There's so much you can do in a year. I'd like to answer that question too. I think what could have been done differently has, could have been done differently along the five elections in three and a half years. And that is that there was never any alternate vision presented. So anybody who fed into the just BB or just not BB camps is actually an integral part of the problem and integrally or inherently not a part of the solution. I think that the votership and the Israeli public that's very politically savvy could have been and should have been presented with much more respect with an alternate with an alternate uh, a, a vision who's, with any vision. Who is responsible for, for creating that vision? Oh Well, the leadership that wants to be elected is responsible for creating a vision and for being able to actually say what yes and not who not. Mm -hmm. Who not is not a vision and who not is not a strong enough glue to hold together any vi very varied very diverse coalition and in fact I think that in many ways the um, the um, sort of dropping by the wayside of the very same principles that 
a lot of these challengers, including you know the party that I was a part of, went or uh, uh, entered the um, political realm to change. Becoming a mirror image of everything that you've set out to change is not change. And using democracy in the process and change in the process and all kinds of very high words and unity, but actually acting exactly against that and undermining democracy. And I'll, I can give multiple examples of just this last Knesset that actually quashed the Knesset, and it has a very important role in democracy. The deal which that, that Co Kohelet actually came out against, is that one of the examples? So 100%, so I, I, I want to say that the agreement with Lebanon, it doesn't matter, by the way, if it's actually a great agreement, or if legally it has to or hasn't, uh, doesn't have to go through the Knesset. The Knesset has a very, very important role as the supervising branch over the executive. And squashing it to non-existent over the course of the year, and that's just one example, I have to be very, very I, I honest, totally agree with you, as, is not a way to balance out. And I think that that was the greatest fault, if you would ask me what happened over the last year that actually undermined the possibility of that coalition government, it might have been good and it might have been able to do good things, but you cannot, in the name of democracy, actually squash democracy or quash democracy, especially when you know that the imbalance of power, and there's an inherent uh, tension between the branches of power in a, gov in a democracy, absolutely. But the way to take back the, um, I'd say the influence or the ability to influence from the, judici from the judicial branch is not by squashing what's known as the legislative branch, especially in its role as the supervisor over the executive. Shahal, we're almost out of time, but I think we need to have at least one more question on foreign policy, considering our audience. Um, you talked about Netanyahu's headaches. Um, and we are, you know, we have viewers that are concerned about what's going on in Europe, which clearly nothing's changing on the ground. Netanyahu still has to make, now, now he's the first, it's the first time for him to be presented with this decision as the executive, what to do about Ukraine with Russia on our Syrian border. So what do you think he's going to be able to do? And what I would you recommend? That, I think that um, it, it is both a huge embarrassment and a mistake. It was, from his point of view, never, never to say a word against Russia, never to condemn this very clear act of unprovoked aggression. Now, I understand that in foreign policy, I wrote a lot of books on foreign policy, there's such a thing as natural interest and real politique. It doesn't always work with your moral values and you have to find a balance. But here, there was no balance at all. He didn't say a word against Russia. And I think that you can definitely keep your uh, freedom of action. He being the, the as previous head of the opposition. Uh. And his, no, as head of the opposition, he didn't say a word against Russia. And his supporters on the social media were all very supportive of Russia, uh, saying Putin, uh, you cannot criticize Putin. Just look at the, at the social media. All his, all his um, supporters uh, on the social media were against Ukraine. Uh, I think that uh, if, and, uh, and I know that you have the statistics to back that up. <laughs> no, no, but I'm telling you, look at, the, okay. look at the social media. His supporters were all, I mean, his most vocal supporters and his trolls were supportive of Russia, including his son, by the way, including his son, who tweeted in Russian to say, don't believe that this is what the Israelis believe. We are always Russia at the beginning of the war. His son, Yair Netanyahu, I'm not making it up, okay? Now, if, as is likely, he becomes prime minister again, I think he'll have to uh, make a very clear statement. Uh, there is today a very clear coalition of free countries, of Western countries against Russia. Make a Russia. statement and arm Ukraine or just I, I didn't say necessarily arm Ukraine, statement. but I think that he has today to realize that there is a very uh, clear coalition of Western countries, of free countries from the United States, Europe, Canada, Australia, Japan, against this act of aggression. It doesn't mean necessarily arming Ukraine with heavy weapons, mm -hmm. but it means finally making a statement uh, against Russia uh, something that he hasn't done until now as head of the opposition. So I'll just say I don't think that a leader of the opposition should be it, it held to account for not making a statement that would He's actually... Head of the opposition, uh, to, to make his statement. But it, that's the Prime Minister's role, so I just, that's just, I mean, I think when it comes to foreign policy, it's probably responsible of the leader of an opposition not to agree or disagree with the Prime Minister who's leading the foreign policy, but that's... Um, he had no problem doing it on the Lebanon deal. I just want to... He had no problem doing it on the Lebanon deal. I just, I just want to say where I think that the... Um, understanding of what's happened with Russia is an opportunity through the lens of, of human rights and international law, and I touched upon it a little bit before. I think that there is not only an opportunity, but an obligation, and 
an incredible resource that is the lens of human rights that hasn't been utilized for the state of Israel from rise to rise from the doctor of the accused. I referred to it before. I believe that even the use of the word hasbara, meaning you have to explain all the time, is something that's been uh, holding us back to a fault because I do believe that the state of Israel upholds international law, respects international law, and is committed to upholding human rights. I do think that there is an opportunity, including with Russia, to relate to what has happened through that lens. I don't know what the implications will be, should be, in terms of what um, the state of Israel will be able to afford. It may be that what it affords is defensive measures for the civilians, and I know that it already has done that. It may be more of that. But on that level, I think that, as I said before, when, and I do think, that there is um, a, a, a weaponization of international law and human rights that actually affects the existential ability of the state of Israel to survive so that we should be treating it as a security issue, then that is a part and parcel of what a prime minister, any prime minister, should be looking at from a wider lens and perspective in terms of Israel's security challenges. And this is an opportunity to actually utilize international law and human rights and insist that they be, be, be upheld and protected and promoted equally and consistently towards all members, including in the very institutions mandated, such as the UN and so forth, the Security Council, mandated to uphold, promote, and protect them. So he, here, is, here is another case where you have the politics influencing diplomacy because we've all heard about the aspirations of the religious Zionists and Bezalel Smutrich to take upon themselves the Ministry of Defense. And when you talk about such, such a situation, whether Israel would or would not provide weapons to the Ukraine, we already fall again into that pit of what's going to happen and what's going to be the composition of of that coalition. Interestingly enough, I wonder what Netanyahu now would really want. We're going to have to keep wondering because Understood. unfortunately we are out of time. Uh, but for those of you watching, you can always feel free to contact the Jerusalem Press Club to hear more amazing insight from Dr. Emmanuel Navon and advocate Michal Kotel Winch. Uh, thank you so much thank for you. coming along. And I, I, um, I could go on, on and on for I haven't even asked half of what I wanted to ask. <laughs>